the leading digital reading platform built on a collection of 40,000 popular high-quality books from over 250 of the world's best publishers. And they are in 90% of U.S. schools and free to use for many students. We have an epic club on Teach Your Kids, and it allows children to choose unlimited books on topics that interest them in particular, fueling a love and interest in reading. And they can brag to friends about how many books they've read. I know kids who are inviting their grandparents to join them on Epic and collect badges for reading their stories. So we just love Epic and are so honored to have the founders here today. Um, so today, before co-founding Epic, Kevin worked at Google in strategic partnerships and was a member of YouTube's original team, serving as vice president of content. Prior to YouTube, Kevin specialized in business development and content for a variety of technology and media companies. He also designed ABC's first online community for kids, creating award-winning games and educational content. Soren has successfully built and scaled several large consumer businesses, including Crowdstore, which rose to become one of the largest social gaming companies with over 200 million users, and also List.am, which is now the largest e-commerce company and online destination in Armenia. Welcome to Teach Your Kids. It's so great to have you here. Thank Thanks, you. Manisha. Great to be here. So perhaps, um, I don't know who might like to begin, but you could start by telling us the story of how you came together to build this incredible reading platform that has helped so many students. I had this idea when I was spending a lot of time with my kids. After I left my uh, previous uh, gaming company, I found myself uh, staying home and basically spending all my days with, uh, with the kids and um, learning their daily lives and daily habits and daily needs. And one of the things I really wanted them to do, just like every parent does, is to read books. And uh, the natural thing was to go buy books in a store, in a bookstore. But I really quickly realized that this is actually not the most optimal experience for the parent and for the child because books are expensive. Because as a new parent, you really don't know what your kids will like and what are the actual right books for the right age of the child. And it's uh, in a world where kids are growing up uh, with tablets in their hands and uh, they're so digital native. Um, you know, reading physical books is great, but there is always um, a demand for more and more content and just cannot keep up with that. And so I had this idea, I became very passionate about solving the problem of reading for kids. And especially coming from uh, the world of games, uh, it was very strange to me that kids have access to any games they want to play for free. They can watch as many videos as they want for free, but they can't read as many books as they want anytime they want. And it was a great experience. It just didn't make sense to me. How come we all talk about the importance of literacy and education, and yet we're building those games and, and videos and distracting kids with social media instead of providing them something useful and something that's beneficial for them in their future life? So I got very passionate about solving this problem, especially knowing that how to build engaging games. I thought I can apply my experience in building engaging products to reading and making reading fun and making reading as fun as playing games and engaging for kids. Um, and so I started talking to people who were also parents about it. Everybody obviously supported the idea. Everybody loved it. Um, and then uh, I started talking to potential investors who all um, seemed to um, really connect with this idea. And one of those potential investors was Kevin. And I'm going to Pass it over to Kevin to uh, tell the rest of the story. Yeah, thanks, Saren. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting how it came together. It seemed um, really uh, fortuitous and magical, kind of for both of us, that it all worked out the way it did. Um, I had left Google and I had been angel investing and advising startups um, for about a year and a half, and I one of the investors that I got to know um, introduced me to Saren. And I uh, met him uh, in Palo Alto at El Fernayo, uh 
at a restaurant and he had a, a laptop and a deck and an idea. And this is the idea. And it, but it was very rudimentary deck, but the idea was, in my mind, just about fully formed. I mean, there was a lot of work we had to do over the years, but he had this great idea. The idea was basically like a Netflix for children's digital books. And over the years, I've worked in children's entertainment quite a bit, um, starting in animation and uh, then working in digital media. And uh, so it's near and dear to my heart. But in addition to that, my daughter was five and she was just starting to read really. And she wasn't reading as much as I wanted her to read. And I had done what Seren had done. I had looked online to see if there was anything really great to really capture her attention. And I was doing what Seren was doing. I was going off and buying my children, my daughter, stacks of books at Barnes and Noble. They're very expensive. And then she'd read them for a while and then go buy another stack of books. And that was very enjoyable for us. But it, number one, it wasn't enough books. And number two, it was very expensive. And I, and I just realized that was a problem for parents that hadn't been solved. And it, uh, so when Seren presented this, um, I had a little notebook of keeping ideas about startups I wanted to get involved with or start. And one of them was a children's digital reading idea, but it wasn't exactly what he had. He had it, I think, just very simply figured out. Seren's very good at thinking in terms of first principles, solving problems for customer, uh, and keeping focused on that, keeping it very simple. And so the way he used to talk about it is getting out of the way, removing the friction between kids and reading. And to me, that's just so powerful. And it's something that parents, all adults really want for children universally, educators and parents particularly. So we knew there would be a massive community of interest amongst adults that would hopefully be interested in this, drive this forward and enable us to create a business around this. But we had to figure out how to, do, how to build a business specifically. Would people uh, pay for a consumer service that was digital reading? We know that kids are very busy in, in their free time after school. There are so many things that they could do from other digital things that are fun, like Minecraft and Roblox to YouTube, to playing sports, to hanging out with their friends, to watching TV, whatever it is, to even watching Netflix. So we knew we'd have a lot of competition as a consumer service, yet we're consumer people. You know, Seren and I both just our entire careers have been really in the consumer space. Um, but interestingly, we didn't realize we were building an education company. Uh, so what, yeah. So what, what happened is I don't want to jump too quickly in the story, but maybe the most significant thing that happened is teachers started demanding this after we launched it and we began offering it for free to schools and that, that changed everything. Wow. That is just fascinating to me that you didn't envision it as an education company when you started. I'm curious. I mean, I don't know what the first iteration of Epic looked like. I've used it a lot with uh, students, but I'm, I'm wondering, you know, if, um, you know, the Kindle Unlimited for kids was around at that time or if they copied you and how you, how you can, first of all, how you competed with videos on Netflix and how you differentiated yourself from the Kindle kids. Yeah, Kindle Free Time Unlimited, the kids version of uh, uh, the Kindle reading product for kids was available. So the investors we would speak to would say, how are you going to compete with Amazon, you know, the 800 pound gorilla? And, um, you know, reading and content and kids are uh, really like almost th those are the three main things that Silicon Valley investors like to stay away from. <laughs> so <laughs> why is really, that, by it, the way, if we might take a little detour? Yeah. Yeah. So raising money at the beginning, um, you know, I'd say the Series A was the challenging part. Um, the, the seed money came fairly quickly because of Seren's background uh, as a serial entrepreneur and, and my background, perhaps, and the team of us together. The, you know, seed money is not too tough to raise in most markets um, when you have some experience. Uh, the Series A is the next level of funding that you raise. And um, you have to prove the business more. You have to prove there's a product market fit. And that there's a business here. But the reason to answer your question is um, th there weren't a lot of examples of, you know, pure like content reading, you know, books, digital books related companies other than Amazon <laughs> that were massively successful. Uh, and same with kids companies, very few that you could count uh, that, Sil that were Silicon Valley funded. Um, and when investors in Silicon Valley VCs are investing, they're looking for many multiples of return on their investment and a billion dollar company at minimum as a, as an outcome. And so those are the challenges you're facing when you're raising money for something like this. How funny, because I mean, it's, it would seem to me that, I mean, the public school 
is you know trillion dollar industry and there's so much money flooding and why why doesn't the uh, the investors make that connection some do but we were really focused on being a consumer company around right, digital okay. reading for kids yeah perhaps if we would have gone out <laughs> and said we're an ed tech company yeah. <laughs> and here's the size of that market and here's you know here are the examples of education technology companies that have exited over a billion or close to it yeah that might have been better um, but we 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 ended up you know playing this interesting role with one foot in clearly in the education world and one foot clearly in the consumer world and then connecting those two communities, which to me and to Seren over time, that made perfect sense because for a child to read more, they need the support of the family, the parent, as well as the teacher. And, um, and there is, and the reading should occur in the home after school, as well as in the school. And so in my mind, we really kind of created the perfect solution that combined both. They could access Epic in the school. We offered it for free to teachers, still do during school hours. We're in about 95% of the U.S. elementary schools, um, used by a couple million teachers. Um, and, um, and then we also offer it for consumers if they want 24-7 access. It's just such a wonderful resource. I mean, I have an online homeschooling community and we have formed a school on Epic and our children just really connect around how many books they've read and what books they're reading. And it's just such a lovely way to build a community around reading. Do you find... Um, one more question for you, Kevin. I mean, since you launched Epic and you started fundraising, and now there are more companies such as Prodigy, Remind, that have used a school-by-school -school approach. Do you see more interest in Silicon Valley in funding education companies? Or is it still a little bit uh, reticent to do so? Yeah, I think specific uh, investors in particular, like Reach Capital, which was uh, one of our greatest supporters. Um, they're very focused on education. And, um, and I think, uh, I think yes, the answer is yes. Um, I think that, uh, there's sort of been a new, um, a new wave of ed tech companies of which we were a part that sort of represented the consumerization of, uh, education technology. Um, meaning the type of experience that we delivered, I think what was so unique about it was that it was very consumer, uh, level in terms of engagement and quality. Uh, for the child. And I think that's really what made the key difference besides the library and the support we got from publishers. The content we have was the really great consumer experience, meaning a high quality, engaging entertainment like experience for children in the classroom that didn't exist before around reading. So there are a lot of companies that are moving in that direction that have been along with us at the same time that we were doing that. Fantastic. And I guess, Sarin, as the product guy, you have a unique challenge in education, which is that the end user is different than the person who's purchasing the product. And I'm curious, what steps did you take to make sure that children were enjoying and engaged in the product? How did you collect user feedback? What was that? What were your goals? And what was that whole process like or continues to be like? I imagine you continue to, to observe how children use it and make it better for them. Yes, uh, so it was very important for us to provide children an experience where they just get in front of the book they want to read. As Kevin mentioned, removing any obstacles between a child and a book is important. Meaning that specifically what we did in the product is we made books immediately appear on screen. While it was very common to uh, download the books and wait for them to download, where you go to buy a book, uh, individual ebook, or uh, you you know want to read a free ebook, you have to download it first. And that was just absolutely unacceptable because kids don't like to wait; they want the instant gratification. So what we did is we developed our own uh, format for streaming books. So that when a child picks a book, they tap on it within a second, they are reading. That was a very important thing for us to do so that kids are not afraid to click on as many books as they want. And another thing we did was that the experience of discovering the books and tapping on the book should be very non-committal. They should feel like they can go in a book, explore it. If they don't like it, they close the book or the next book. And they don't have to commit to reading it. They can explore as much as they want until they find the book they like, and they will. Because every kid has their own interest at any given time, and they need just to find the right books, and then you got them to read, then they're engaged, then they're, they can be there for many, many minutes or 
even longer than that. And so those two things made a lot of difference in terms of getting kids to love to browse, to love to discover, and to read. The other very important things we did a little bit later was to build a very uh, complex and sophisticated recommendation system, uh, which is um, taking into account a child's reading level, reading ability, their interests, and their age um, to recommend them the books that they would like to read. It's a much more complex system than recommending content for adults because most adults are already formed and they don't change year over year or they don't even change uh, months after months. But kids, their interests change weekly. And as they grow and mature in the world, you know, you got to keep up with their uh, demands for content. And so we've developed a system that it would actually would change the books and present them the right books um, week after week based on what they're reading and what the reading abilities are and so on. And so that also made sure that we put the right child in front of the right book um, as soon as they enter the app or enter um, our, our service. That's so phenomenal. And I just want to highlight that you choose both age and reading level as criteria, because I think that's so important because especially with gifted children, we often see they develop asynchronously where they might love cute, fuzzy baby animals, but they're reading at high school level. So um, I think that's pro- really part of your power that you're able to do that. And, and unfortunately, quite rare in educational products. Did you ever find, um, you know, and I'm, I'm not sure what processes you used if you um, watch children using Epic or, you know, you got feedback. Did you ever feel like there were times where what you thought children wanted conflicted with what parents or teachers wanted? How did you navigate those different interests in your product? You know, we, we went to... Uh, you want to yeah, dig, dig onto that one, Kevin? <laughs> well, I just thought of something funny, but certain, uh, <laughs> we, yeah, we used to have a book called Richard is a Picker about the nose picker. <laughs> kids loved it and it was really gross and you know illustrated in a really funny way but uh, i think parents weren't so excited about that book but kids would read more when they would read that book that's for sure oh man so what did you do did you keep it on or did you have oh, to? oh yeah yeah we kept okay. it yeah that's good that's parents good. <laughs> can block any book they don't like so there, there are tools to block it just like teachers they can you can block books, you know, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Parents can ban their own books instead of having the state <laughs> ban. They can. What were you going to say, can. Sarin? Yeah, the good thing about having this uh, book, like like Karen mentioned, the Richard was a picker book. It was a funny book; kids loved it. But then it served as a entry uh, way into the world of books for for some kids who so would start with that book, read it, have fun, and then they would go on and discover some other books. Fantastic. I mean, this actually makes me think about what's going on in Florida right now. And I mean, America in many feel, and I agree that there's a kind of heightened sensitivity about what kind of content should be included and not included in books. And I mean, some of my friends who are teachers in Florida have found that books are suddenly disappearing from their library, books about Black history and I'm wondering if you have had any pushback from people about the content of your books and how you handle that in terms of, you know, having diverse content in this very, this world where people are so highly sensitive. Yeah. I think that, um, uh, any, any time you have a content platform of any kind, um, you're going to have, I saw this at YouTube and, and to really an extreme degree because of the amount of content and the user uploaded content. You have a lot of opinions about that content. Um, when you're dealing with children, like we are, you have a lot of opinions about content and what's, what's good for them, what's uh, appropriate for them. Parents have a lot of different ideas of what they want their children to read. Um, and we have always worked with professional, high-quality publishers. Most of them uh, publish books for uh, schools already. Um, so we work with high quality content. That's been one thing that we are careful to do. The other thing is we have given, as I mentioned a moment ago, the power of control over what their children experience to the parents and to the teacher. And so we think of it like, you know, like a library and the teacher or the parent, if they were to take a visit with a child to a library, they can direct them to certain books. Um, you know, they can let them roam free. Um, I think the power of Epic is the freedom 
And so that's why if a, if a parent really does disagree with the book, doesn't think it's uh, something they want their child to, to read for any reason, they could remove that book from view for the child. And the child would still have that sense of freedom and to move around inside the library of 40,000 pieces of content. So that's the way we've dealt with it. We, we try to be really the Switzerland, uh, you know, uh, totally neutral party, just looking for high quality literature that we're going to provide and make available. I think that's super smart. You know, just the power of giving the parent the option to choose as opposed to imposing choices on them. Um, I'm very curious about gamification, and I'm sure everybody asks you about this. But um, I, I have come across very few really engaging gamified learning apps. It's still an area that I believe needs a lot of exploration. So I was having a an interview. With, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Naval Ravikant. He founded Angel.co and is very popular on Twitter. And and he was saying that he really wished there was a math app that was ad- as addictive as Fortnite. Um, do you agree? Um, first of all, I guess maybe why aren't there more gamified products? And on the other side of that, can a learning app be too addictive? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe Sarin, what do you think that a learning app can be too addictive? I mean, you understand how to build these bells and whistles that make um, games engaging. Um, are there ones that you avoid or do you just kind of bring it on if it's educational? Yeah, first of all, yes, I think a gaming uh, service or platform can be addictive, but not because it's gamified, but because its content is interesting to the learner. And I find that, again, just like with finding the right book, if you find the right content that you love to learn about, you will be engaged for a long time. Uh, We always uh, saw gamification as an enhancement to the core experience, but not as the absolutely must have. Because without the great content that we have, there wouldn't be any uh, success or, or gamification wouldn't even work. So what we did is we enhanced the experience by making it fun, nudging kids to earn some badges, you know, to level up, to read more because of that. But we always were aware that we shouldn't cross the line and we shouldn't become a game and we shouldn't distract the kids from reading because if they spend too much time playing or doing some activity that is not related to reading, then we are actually not um, focused on our core mission, which is getting kids to read more. Uh, but if we gamify it enough to bring back the kids every day to read, for example, we have this 20 minute timer every day, which is uh, 20 minutes is, is a recommended time to read every day for kids. Uh, and then if you complete your 20 minutes every day, you get a reward. Um, and that's great. But if you come to the app with the mindset of, I'm going to just play some little games and that happens to the reading, this isn't. What we want is and what our mission. So we were able to find this great balance between making it slightly gamified and fun, but yet keeping reading and books uh, the center focus of the experience. Fantastic. And Kevin, what are your thoughts? Is there is it possible for an educational game to be too addictive? How do you define that line that Seren is describing? I think if you create a successful educational app. Uh, meaning it's really uh, succeeding in terms of its goals for the learning. Um, I think it, it's almost not possible. <laughs> I think it's a good thing uh, if a child's learning and he's using so On the other hand, uh, I'll give you the other side. Uh, I guess I'm going to re- rephrase that. If my child was constantly on an app or a computer doing nothing else in their life, no, I wouldn't be happy with that. So I think one of the things we've done with Epic is to provide opportunities and uh, incentive for kids, uh, inspiration for kids to go offline and to do things. So with the videos that we provide, which we call learning videos very specifically, they're short form videos that um, many of them are how to, and some of them are how to do things like how to kick a soccer ball or, you know, how to, you know, go bird watching or whatever it might be um, outdoors and do something. So when I think about my daughter and what I want for her, even now that she's 16, I want her to do a combination of things, you know, to learn, to spend time, sure, of course, on digital devices and then books, physical books too, but also to be outside and to do physical things. That's wonderful. I love that you're finding that balance. And it's, it's intriguing to me that you don't think that it can be too addictive. That's kind of a... 
I guess it's kind of a relief for me to know that um, that is true. And and I guess, I mean, Kevin, you're also an investor in the educational space. And I mean, I've seen a lot of learning apps and a lot of education um, curriculum. And I just feel like there's not a lot of great educational apps out there that are highly engaging, that are gamified. Is that your impression as well? And And if not, why aren't more people building in this space? Yeah, I think there have been some good ones like Brain Pop um, and others. Um, and I think that um, we are going to see probably more uh, companies trying to build greater engagement into their apps, um, seeing the success of companies like Epic and others. Um, and um, yeah, I think it's a really good time for ed tech companies. I think um, we're seeing a lot of creativity and um, uh, I think that it'll be uh, really exciting over the next few years to see what develops. That's exciting. Well, the homeschooling community continues to grow. And so hopefully more people will be building for that space. Uh, I actually just love the read to me feature. Um, for any of you who have used Epic before, there's this really cool feature where on some of the books, you can actually push a button and you'll hear a voice read and then um, the word that's being read will light up. And I think it's a really uh, fantastic way to help develop literacy in children. Was that a feature there to begin with? Or did you have a, an aha moment where you added that? Uh, maybe, Sarin, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that because I just I really like that feature. Yeah, this is one of the most popular features on, on Epic, especially with younger kids who are uh, just learning to read or starting to read. And um, it really is uh, teaching kids to love reading. And we've heard from uh, a lot of teachers that they had reluctant readers in their class until they've discovered Epic and they tried to read the new books. They followed along a little bit. They discovered the joy of uh, reading and, and all the stories that they suddenly uh, realized exist out there. And they became avid readers in the class. So we converted reluctant readers to avid readers thanks to um, this feature, the read to me uh, And we added it fairly early on, not in the first uh, few releases, obviously, but fairly early on, we've added it and it became super, super popular. I'm curious to know why you haven't expanded to high school. And part of the reason I ask this is because I've noticed that a lot of these wonderful education technology companies stop at sixth grade or eighth grade. Uh, is there a particular reason that you haven't expanded to older grades? I'd say there's there's a lot to be done still in the elementary school area where we are really f experts at this point. And uh, there's a lot to be done domestically and internationally there. And one example of that is the fact that we've now begun selling Epic to schools and districts for 24-7 access. So as I mentioned earlier uh, on this con in this conversation that we do offer it free to schools during school hours, 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. We've been doing that for several years. Uh, during COVID, during the height of COVID, I should say, for a couple of years, we, we enabled when kids were home, we enabled families to have 24-7 access to Epic. Um, we're a very mission-oriented company. We felt that was the right thing to do. Um, it, of course, had benefits for us because I think we gained a lot of loyal users and teachers really, I think, loved us even more when we did that. Um, and, uh, you know, we, our reach became greater because more parents learned about Epic. But, but yeah, we weren't charging uh, for a pretty lengthy period of time, uh, giving away 24-7 access to Epic. So now then after COVID began to subside and normalcy was coming back, kids were going to school again, we reverted back to what we originally had done, which is 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. only in the classroom. So teachers would like to have that 24-7 so they can assign homework to children. So that's now what we've begin, begun doing is also beyond selling it to consumers, also selling it to districts and schools. And how were you able to offer free service during the pandemic? Was that because of your investors or you were still getting enough through subscriptions or Seren and Coven, you just charged up your credit cards? And what, <laughs> how were you able to, to offer that during that difficult time for people? Well, we had great support from our investors and um, the e economics of this model of our company enables us to do that because we also have supportive publishers who are really partners and invested in the overall success of Epic and the way that we have uh, designed the, uh, the financial arrangement with them. 
Fantastic. And, you know, it's just so beautiful to see this commitment you have to equity in education. And I'm curious, maybe, Saran, you can comment, what are some of the challenges of getting Epic to 100% of students? I mean, I think about students who don't have internet access. I mean, you would even have to lay down a cable to get internet access or might not have a tablet. Um, is there some ability to use Epic offline? Um, how, how are you limited and how are you addressing those problems? Yeah, I think there isn't a single challenge. There are many uh, different challenges that uh, could prevent us from getting to 100% of uh, the kids. Uh, but as you mentioned, not everybody yet has internet access uh, or access to devices. Um, not even uh, every school has yet devices. And um, many schools that do, they um, their flows or their, their habits in the classroom aren't to use, um, you know, reading Online, they're still, um, you know, more uh, using more traditional physical books. So it is a process that is, um, thankfully, we're growing and we see more and more kids are uh, using Epic. Um, and uh, yes, we do have offline access, but this requires obviously online access first to download the books. But we did, um, we do offer that feature uh, to even our classrooms so that they can download the, uh, the books and read them offline. Uh, but I, I am very optimistic about the future and I know more and more uh, kids uh, come online and start using devices for uh, educational activities, including reading. And so we're going to be seeing more and more adoption over time. What keeps you committed to, to working on this project? Um, I'll speak briefly and then let Seren talk. Uh, uh, basically, I think what we didn't realize when we started the company is how rewarding this would be. We knew it was a great idea that it was going to be putting, putting some good into the world that would affect our actual children. It was solving a problem that we really felt as parents. But for this, this is such a universal thing to provide tools for teachers and parents uh, to enable their children to have this freedom of reading and learning that really empowers children in so many different ways. And to see the success of the platform in terms of how many lives it's changed, how many children have become readers and have learned things and uh, really learned how to learn independently in many ways by using Epic. The adoption by the schools is probably the most humbling thing. Um, it really is a massively used uh, product platform. The schools and teachers truly do love Epic. Whenever we go to conferences, uh, I feel sometimes like we're the Beatles, you know, <laughs> according to teachers, like they just <laughs> swarm us and uh, it feels so great. We feel so lucky to, to have that love from the teachers, but we really respect them. And uh, it, to me, there's nothing that could feel better than what we're doing every day. We get up every morning and this is what we get excited about doing because of what we're seeing happening in the world. And that's how we've been able to attract such an amazing team. So... I've kind of said it all probably, but I'll pass it to Saran. Saran, what would you <laughs> add to that? Yeah, no, this is pretty much the reason uh, we've enjoyed this journey. Uh, for me, it's been probably the most rewarding and amazing experience of my professional life. Um, and uh, it's seeing the impact, seeing that we are potentially changing lives of millions of kids and they will grow up and they will become somebody very successful and we will have played a little part in that. Hopefully, we would have inspired them to do something great in life. We may never know that, but we're pretty sure that we are helping an entire new generation discover this amazing world of literature and reading and inspire them to do some amazing things in the future. So this has been, I don't know if we can even beat that in the future, if we can build anything better than that. But um, this uh, journey has been so amazing. And I would say even the team that we were able to attract and build, they all came with this huge passion for education, for helping teachers, for helping kids. And so working with that amazing team has been also very rewarding for us. It's so inspiring to see how the meaning you find in your work energizes you. And... I think anybody who's thinking about creating in this space, it's just rocket fuel for building. And it's a beautiful example of a way to live in the world. So Surin, you are a parent and I think Kevin as well, and you're laser focused on this reading literacy space. Are there any types of educational products you would like to see someone else build for your kids that would support them? Yes, I think there are a lot of things uh, that can be done. 
with the way we see education is changing. It's becoming a lot more creative and freeform. And so helping kids unleash their creativity using uh, technology would be a very interesting challenge. And I think um, I always believe that there is something in every child that you just have to unlock and uncover and let them go crazy with their passion. And so uh, creativity has been always a very like independent thing and creativity has been always a very important uh, thing. Uh, and I, I believe there's a big opportunity for someone to help kids unleash that creativity in them. I love that. Um, I think often a role of a teacher is just uh, unblocking obstacles to the natural passion for learning rather than being the one to create a passion. But I am curious. I mean, maybe they're secret, but I, as an entrepreneur, I kind of, I have a Google doc where I list the ideas that, for startups that I have because I have, I can't get distracted, you know, otherwise I'll start building them like, Oh, I want to build a math app. That's like a game. Or I want to build this. Do you have any um, ideas that you put on a little scratch pad that maybe someone in uh, my community could pick up and create? We do. Think um, many. <laughs> we think a lot about this. <laughs> Are they secret? <laughs> uh, I've been noticing a lot of people who uh, enter the edu- ed tech and education space, they stay there. They go on to do something else at the same space because it's so rewarding. Um, and so uh, I hope that we also uh, have a lot of interesting things in front of us and that Epic also uh, continues to do a lot of interesting and innovative things. Um, and I think the education space is changing very rapidly. The pace of change is accelerating. And uh, we, we all have to start thinking beyond the traditional um, based education where there are a lot of new subjects, for example, that um, schools just cannot keep up with because um, the world is changing much faster today. than Sure. Data before. science, AI. Yeah, for things. sure. Um, and so we got to teach our kids a lot of things that they will use when they grow up that will be relevant in this world, you know, 10, 20 years from now. Wonderful. Okay. Well, we'll be excited to see what ideas are lurking <laughs> in your brain. Um, Kevin, uh, do you have any advice for education entrepreneurs who are thinking of building in this consumer space to parents who are trying to, you know, help support their children's education? Yeah, I guess uh, for any startup uh, founders, I would say find a, a complimentary partner. Um, it's good to have two people when you're going through a, a journey like this, when you're building a company, it's not always easy. And it's great to have someone that really complements your skill set. From the standpoint of ed tech and, and consumer in particular, I'd say it's really got to, the idea has to cut through the noise of all the other things that the kids could be doing in their free time uh, after school. So it has to be something very important, very meaningful. It has to be a must have for parents. So reading and literacy is one of those things. Um, books are seen by parents as uh, always positive. Um, and so uh, for us, that, that was uh, fairly easy. We, we chose something that was already in the forefront of the mind of a parent in terms of what they wanted their children to do. Wonderful. How did you know that you were a match made in heaven or did you just get lucky? Well, I knew a bit about Cern's background when I met him. So uh, I told him when uh, when I first met him and he thought I was approaching as an investor that I pretty soon after I heard his idea, I said, okay, let's be partners. You know, let's do this. I, I know we compliment each other. I know, you know, this idea is one I relate to as well. And so we pretty quickly came to that conclusion. But over the years, we've seen how much uh, it works. Our philosophy on product building, on team management, um, on life, it's pretty similar, similar values. And, uh, so that was it. But later I discovered, this is quite interesting that, uh, years into our working relationship, I found out that previously we had lived on the same street in San Mateo and, uh, Seren had lived down the street like a block and a half from me, but we had never met. And then I found out as well that he has the same birthday as my father. So I was like, Whoa, okay. Those are some signs. I should be working with this guy. Extraordinary. That's just amazing. I mean, you guys have all the elements. You have the mission, you have the magic, you have you have everything. Oh, that's incredible. I have to I have to mention this. We'd be nowhere without the team we were able to pull into Epic. So I'd say attract people that are smarter than you around you. That's the other thing. And so we've done that and built an amazing team. And when you have a mission like this, you can attract the best and brightest. So that's the final piece of advice for the 
the young founders. Yeah. That is a very good piece of advice. Attract people who are smarter than you and have the humility to recognize who's smarter than you. I did want to ask you, Saran, about children who have reading disabilities such as dyslexia. Are there mechanisms that are built into Epic to support those types of readers? Uh, yes. So we actually have a lot of kids who have uh, learning reading disabilities. Um, and teachers have teachers in general have been champions for uh, using Epic with these kids. Um, so while we haven't specifically designed um, Epic, we are always trying to uh, cover all the different use cases. And, uh, you know, Reach to Me is a great example of the tool that uh, many kids uh, with uh, learning disabilities can use. Um, and obviously, we are always continuing to uh, get feedback with teachers. There's a constant dialogue with our teachers that we get a lot of interesting uh, ideas and uh, feedback from them. And we always listen and try to um, uh, incorporate it into the product. It's so fantastic. And I just appreciate so much the, the work that you're doing for parents and for children. I, I have two ideas for Epic, if I could share them with you while you're here. Yeah. So one thing I think would be so great is to have some element of human storytelling. Because when I look at YouTube, often there'll be someone who's reading a book to children and they're flipping the pages. And I've often thought like, wow, I could use Epic and go on YouTube and just turn the page. But then I thought that would probably be illegal. So I think that having you know actors and actresses or even parents reading the book, because right now the read to me is more automated. I think that could be really amazing. And then as you think about content creation... I feel like it would be really cool to hire parents to create some of the content because a lot of, you know, stay at home parents or parents with part time jobs are looking for extra income that they can do at home. And I think that could be a great way to uh, get some extra income for family. So my two Somebody cents that I you, wanted to you, <laughs> throw you your job way. As a pro- want a job as a product manager? Those are great ideas. <laughs> Maybe we'll see how things go with my online homeschooling community. Yeah, yeah. On the side, you can do it. Yeah. No, anyway. But those are good ideas. Thank you. Those are really good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I mostly want to be the actress that reads the story. I think that could be kind of fun. (laughs) Are there any kind of really key uh, things in how you designed Epic or aspects of Epic that we didn't hit upon today that you want to make sure people listening here? Yeah, I mentioned you know I mentioned things like uh, super important to uh, remove all the barriers between the child and a and a book, and so getting kids to to the book as soon as possible. I think one thing we didn't talk about, which is very important, is that giving kids control over their choices and the freedom to roam around, find books and read them without a librarian or a teacher or parent telling that them to read a specific book. So putting kids in the driver's seat, uh, giving them, them that uh, sense of uh, choice and freedom was super important for us. And I think we were able to to deliver on that and build that platform in a way where kids, they can read books any, at any level, you know, a, a, without having, uh, without thinking about somebody else will, you know, judge them or see them. They're free to live in this world of books uh, the way they want. That's such a great point. And one um, issue we talk a lot about on the podcast is how little agency children have over their own lives. And I'm sure that this is one of the reasons that Epic with over 40,000 books is so appealing is that children do have that freedom to choose what they want to read within a framework that protects them and keeps them safe. And I've experienced children who say, you know, I just don't like to read. I don't want any book. And then I say, well, what about a book about Minecraft? (laughs) And then their interest peaks up and you really do have something for everyone. How about you, Kevin? Is there anything we haven't touched upon that you want to highlight? Well, one thing we didn't talk about is our originals. Um, so we, one of the interesting things that we did at Epic is we took all of this experience. Kids now read a billion books a year on Epic, which is astounding. Um, and um, we've been in business for over 10 years. Uh, and so w- with all of this information about what kids like um, by age group... Um, we took that information and we said, okay, how can we create internally a publishing company really to create just for Epic, um, original books, original book series. And that's what we did. So, so we've created several hundred books already on Epic that are originals that, 
uh, take everything we've learned about engagement, like the audio component and, and the read to me and, um, and everything we've learned about the, the subject matter that kids like, the formats kids like, things like graphic novels and action and humor, animal characters, things like that. And we, we really built it a world-class team from the world of children's publishing and brought them in people who are editors and writers and illustrators and art directors. And, uh, and it's a really thriving part of our business. Kids love it. We have series like cat ninja and scaredy monster and a series called. Animal oh yes. Rescue I'm Friends. very familiar with cat yeah. ninja. <laughs> yeah. Kids even yeah. dress up as cat ninja. So fantastic. Now. It's, it's such a big thing. Yeah. But, um, I think that, that also, has been really I don't know whether exciting. to thank you for writing cat ninja ninja or to curse you for writing God ninja <laughs> but yes it's very popular yeah i'll pass it along i'll pass just it because along i've to had team. to read it so many times <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. understood understood yeah i'm just i'm just so thrilled that this resource exists in the world and you know just even beyond reading i mean thinking about you can learn about history and science and it, you know as you say sure and like just take away the block between the children and the book and once you know how to read and epic does have very early pre-readers for kids who are just learning how to read i mean then the whole world is available to them they can learn any subject and science and history and really follow their curiosity to the limit so it's such a fantastic resource for self-directed education. Yeah, I think you nailed it right there, Manisha. Self-directed education is part of really the core of what makes Epic so great. Um, Trent talked about, you know, giving kids the, the power to choose what they want to read. It's also choosing what they want to learn. And it's also over time teaching them how to be um, proficient at self-learning. Yes. And one fun fact I think Seren cited is that um, on, a, on another podcast is that I believe a New York Times bestseller reaches five, sells 5,000 copies. And how much do the best selling books on Epic, how many reads do they get? Yeah. Something like Cat Ninja gets about a million reads in a few days uh, when a new uh, episode comes out, a new book, you know. And of course, Richard was a picker gets. I think a billion reads a week. No, I'm kidding. But uh, that was popular. It's, <laughs> it's possible. It's all, it Children are more avid yeah. readers than their parents. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's great. It's great to see the numbers. Um, you're right. It's, it's very interesting. The world of physical publishing uh, is so limited by the fact that books have to be produced and distributed and sold and uh, digital in the way that we do it. Um, there are no limitations to how many kids can read any individual book. Just the internet and the access to electricity. So I like to finish up every episode by asking my guests, what's something that you are learning right now? And the best answers are completely unrelated to anything that we've talked about. It could be something interpersonal. It could be about health and diet. One person talked about a 10,000-year-old worm that came back to life. Uh, anything you're studying or a fact you learned that you would want to share? Either of you can <laughs> start. Um, you know, I would say one interesting thing is for me is learning to see the world through the eyes of my kids. And as I see them grow up and I interact with them every day, it's amazing that how differently they look at certain things and how different their perceptions are of uh, things that we discovered together. What we like to do is we travel a lot with the kids. We explore new things that are new for us and new for them. And it's very interesting to see how they complement um, our impressions of new things. And so I'm learning um, to see the world through their eyes. It's a very, very unique and interesting experience for me. I've been studying meditation mm. and practicing it. <laughs> to, uh, I love that. Is there a certain teacher or an app or book? No, various, various teachers, various methods just to, um, I think to clarify my mind and it makes me more, I think, uh, I think more effective in my work and also, uh, more present for anything I'm doing. So it's been very helpful. How beautiful. I, I really see the connection there between meditation and connecting with your children. It's, so beautiful. Well, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to come here today and talk to our community and for building Epic. It's definitely 
one of my favorite learning apps. I often tell families, you know, if you want to start homeschooling, you really need just good English language arts curriculum and a good math curriculum. And I often just say, you know, if your kids like video games, if they like YouTube, just use Epic for English language arts and you can use Prodigy Game or Beast Academy for math and you're set. And after that, they can pursue their own interests and they'll have a very strong foundation for their education. So it's just, it's amazing that you built it. I'm so happy that it exists. And if families are interested in joining our online homeschooling community, we do have an Epic Classroom ourselves. So just go to teachyourkidspod.com and you can join Epic. You can join book clubs around Cat Ninja if that's what interests you. And you can get more support around your child's education. If they have a reading disability, we can help you understand how to help them or get support for them. So that's teachyourkidspod.com. So thank you so much, Kevin and Seren. And we will provide a link for Epic in the show notes if you haven't heard of it already. It's just an extraordinary resource. And we love you guys so much. So thank you so much for all you do. And thank you for being here today. 